Hey, um, so welcome to welcome to Nitro and uh, the C++ uh, C C++ meetup. Um, I'm not going to keep you long. Uh, just doing a, a very brief intro. Uh, my name is actually it's David O'Donoghue. I'm the VP of Engineering here in Nitro. Um, so I hope you enjoy the the food and the drink. Uh, we're just about to start. Um, uh, I guess just a tiny bit of background. I think we we moved into this building. When was it? April. April this year. So we're here six months. And one of the things we really loved about this space when we were looking at uh, spaces was this very area that you're sitting in. Um, we have a massive desire really to participate in all of the communities that we operate within. And uh, the previous building we were in, we were, we were very significantly, significantly constrained in terms of what we could do. So um, we're really excited to be in this building and actually have the space specifically so that we can host events like this. Um, we do, do do this actually for, as I said, the different do domains that we operate in. Um, so we're interested in many other things like... Um, uh, cloud technologies and Scala and data science. These are things that generally we operate in, in, in here. But I assume you're probably already aware um, our most successful product is something called Nitro Pro and it's something that's built entirely in C++. So I think it's fair to say that C++ is, uh, is very special technology to us, very, very, very close to our hearts indeed. Um, okay, so, I mean, we have two... Fantastic speakers here and two very interesting topics um, this evening. Uh, Oliveira, which, uh, who I haven't met previously, but uh, Oliveira, I believe, is going to be talking to us about Code Checker. And then we will have Justin talking about um, exploring uh, coroutines in C20. Uh, so, as I said, uh, very brief, you're very welcome. I hope you enjoy the evening. And uh, I will let Oliveira begin. Um, hi, and thanks for coming. <laughs> I hope that you will uh, find the topic interesting. Uh, I thought that uh, it makes sense to present you this open source project that Ericsson is contributing in after we had that uh, meetup in May, I think, when we looked into this Clang Tidy capabilities. And I, I don't know if Steven is around, but he presented some uh, little debugging framework that was created and it can be useful for this type of thing. So let's see what we will, and I'll also start recording here as well. Hmm? Uh -huh. Sorry, just to do one more thing because if people come maybe. Uh, Okay, so. And then we put it so first of all, what I will cover. First, uh, I wasn't sure what is the background of, in the audience and how familiar you are with uh, static code analysis in general. And uh, just as information, how many of you are currently using some static code analysis tools for C++? So not, not all of the uh, people in the audience. I'll give some introduction and background related to general static code analysis usage. And I think that's completely transferable to other languages. It's not specific only for C++. Uh, after that, I'll explain what this code checker project is about and then uh, what are the features why you might consider to use it in your own organizations? Uh, the main advantage is that this one is completely free, no hidden license costs or anything. And uh, of course, you are maybe wondering why Ericsson, who is telecom company, is uh, contributing to, to this type of tool. So I'll try to explain that along the way as well. Then I'll show you some demo and uh, uh, then how you can deploy it and what would be limitations and next steps. So first of all, uh, introduction. In general, when we have uh, static code analysis tools, main reason why we use them is to find bugs. And if you find problems in your code, then obviously 
from the point of view that uh, uh, your code will be more robust, you will fix some security holes in your uh, uh, baseline. Uh, customer will be happier because uh, you will not have to go back to fix the R's. Cost will be smaller. So there is a number of reasons why we should use FATI code analysis tools. And uh, in some cases, in smaller companies, maybe you're not aware of all of these, um, let's say, possibilities, but for example, for Ericsson, having uh, trouble reports from the customer can be very costly if the network is down or something. So in Ericsson, we pay a lot of attention to quality. And uh, another thing is that uh, we want to uh, comply to coding standards. So usually in the companies you define which coding standards you want to use. Uh, while using static code analysis and understanding what are the problems and how they should be addressed, you improve the knowledge of your designers as well. So that's side effect of the usage. And then uh, you can find optimization opportunity and visualize uh, um, problem description of your uh, trouble reports that are just reported through the tool and get some metrics about the quality of the code along the way. So uh, there is no need to run additional test cases. So you don't have to write test code. And depending on how good is the tool, there are a lot of tools on the market. I listed here just some of them. But uh, in fact, uh, um, there are many of them. If you just do search C++ static code analysis, you will find hundreds. <laughs> uh, some are smaller, some are bigger. And depending on the uh, quality of tool, you can get some more advanced features. And some of them are this full path coverage or statistical checkers. Uh, you can get a very good inline explanation of the code. And uh, depending on uh, how good is the tool, you might uh, have a faster analysis, you can have a longer path being explored, you can have accuracy that is better or worse, no tool will find all bugs. So no matter, in completeness, it's even proven that it cannot <laughs> find all bugs. Uh, usability aspects, some tools are uh, more user friendly and easier to, to uh, follow the explanation of the problems. Then support for the different versions of operating system. Uh, when you move to the later, let's say Red Hat version or something, maybe the tool that you used before doesn't support it and then you're stuck and you have to see what to do. Uh, uh, support for the new, uh, new versions of the language standards. So C++ 11, 14, 20 and so on. Not all of the tools follow it. So then again, you can be stuck because of that. And another thing is some are commercial, some are open source. For commercial tools, you have to pay. <laughs> and uh, there are different license models. Some are per lines of code, some are number of developers, some are, think about it, whatever <laughs> you come up with. Uh, but uh, of course, these commercial tools are usually, uh, they do charge a lot, but they're very good. And they do find a lot. And uh, they can help to improve the code. Uh, why they're so expensive and what makes the difference? Well, they're using different analysis techniques. And in general, uh, no tools, two tools use exactly the same thing. And because they're using different uh, techniques, they find different things after that. And uh, uh, Clang Static Analyzer is in fact uh, uh, having a lot of these uh, advanced things. So control flow analysis, pointer analysis, abstract execution. So if you use Clangsa, you get for free a lot of uh, things that are advanced. But you don't have a very good overall summary in some nice web GUI, so that's missing. Uh, so some of these checking techniques are textual pattern matching, ST matching, abstract interpretation. And as you see here, different tools use different techniques. Some are um, very good in having low number of false positives. For example, CPP check claims that they have zero number of uh, if you find it, if report it, they'll fix it immediately. Their approach is they don't want uh, to report anything that is maybe fault, maybe not. Others at the other side want to report as much as possible so that you don't miss something. So we have some statistical checkers. Maybe it's problem, maybe not, but it's better to tell me that than to have customer TR. So there are different strategies there. Uh, and. Uh, of course, depending on the techniques, then you come with this problem of false positives. <laughs> Tool sometimes reports too much and there are bugs and you don't want too many of them. 
So uh, why? Because that's waste. Uh, our uh, designers have to go through false positive, spend time, and then at the end throw it as a, you know, not correct. But uh, false negative rate is also dangerous. False negative is when tool doesn't report the real findings. So you have customer TR, you know it should have been found, you check and no, with current settings, it's not. So both of things are uh, important to follow and uh, tools usually have false path pruning to improve this false positive rate so that you have less things reported to eliminate at least some of the false positives. So these are just some illustrations how it looks in the practice. So first one is this pattern matching where you have some kind of regular expression when it's uh, replaced then uh, you can see how the original code looks like and what desired code will look like. And if it doesn't meet the you know, uh, rules, then you report it as a bug. Another one is these AST matchers. So you start off from your code and then do the abstract syntax tree spread and then uh, I detect if something is not conforming to the thing and just report suspicious code if it's not matching it. Sorry. Another one would be symbolic execution, where you simply start from your code and uh, when you see some of the uh, things that are symbols, you continue to explore the code using that. So different tools, different techniques, they find different things. But what's then? There is no silver bullet. In general, more tool, the more tools you use, the more is the chance that you will find real bugs. And of course, the more tools you use, there are pros and cons. Some pros would be, uh, you will find defects, you will have better quality, you will detect problems very early, you will have less security vulnerability, someone will not manage to you know, intrude your code in a ways that you don't like. Uh, you will have less vendor lock-in, so you're not happy with some vendor, too expensive, they blackmail you with a new <laughs> license model, you say, sorry guys, we have another option. And uh, that's one of the reasons also to uh, get involved in the open source community like Ericsson. <laughs> so uh, Ericsson doesn't uh, produce tools uh, for static code analysis as a first thing, but uh, we did explore uh, contributing to open source community together with other bigger companies to get uh, uh, another tooling on the side that can detect problems. And then, of course, that's nice and fine, but then you also have all of these false positives that you have to go through and it can be waste sometimes, but usually some checkers are better than others. So that's where you can also concentrate on the most problematic and uh, dangerous ones. More hardware usage. You don't want to put everything into the maybe verification loops for, uh, in Git, but at the other side, you can run that less frequently, some of the tools. Some can be in every commit, some can be once per week or month or whatever. So there are ways to uh, somehow uh, mitigate that. Then more education is needed. You have to in introduce your designers to all of those tools. Everyone is different. And uh, more cost if you use a couple of commercial tools. And then there is a problem if you think, think of open source tools, there are so many of the open source projects just to find something. When I was preparing for this pre presentation, I searched code checker. And of course, I didn't find Ericsson code checker tool. I found another code checker tool that is completely different thing. So just with the name even you cannot easily find that there are millions of projects in, unless you know what you are looking for in this big hey, you know, needle will not be found easily. And then another thing is the more projects there are, what is the value of the individual project? You know, it's just small group use it. Well, you don't have as much contributions. And one of the ideas why I wanted to present today is that we expand open source community. If you like it, if you think it's valuable, join the community and then let's develop uh, further. Is there anyone from Facebook at the moment in the audience? No, for example, Facebook has Facebook uh, Infer. It's also open source tool, it's a good tool. We are developing in par parallel, but that doesn't mean that uh, some things cannot be uh, united. So, uh, as said, successful projects depend on members, on community, and on, on expanding things. Uh, our group in Ericsson is, uh, uh, our code checker team is uh, uh, in Hungary. Just let me check if anyone joined because now it's time. So uh, 
We have a team in Hungary that is uh, uh, closely cooperating with the uh, university in Budapest. So many of the new checkers were in fact some PhD students developing it and getting PhD at the end of it. It's very much scientifically grounded. They are presenting the LLM um, conferences and, and so on. So the, the background of it is like that. And they're contributing to the new checkers with an analyzing features. And I'll present you now this cross-translational um, cross unit and statistical analysis. Those are two very important ones that are on the top of Klangsa and that give a lot of new findings. And of course, bug fixes for the current checkers. And they are for six years already uh, working on this. So then the next thing, what is code checker? Uh, I will uh, share the slides with you. So after the presentation, you will get it in the meetup link somewhere, you will update. So uh, that is open source project in GitHub, you have uh, the link. We have documentation in this second and third. Uh, then there is a, a setup that I will uh, show where we are, have run a couple of the open source project just to demonstrate how the tools look like. And you can install it yourself and run it on your code. Plus, uh, it's um, just the framework around Clang static analysis and Clang tidy. So there is a, a links also to the different checkers that these uh, that are supported by Clang and Clang static analyzer. So uh, what do we have? First of all, uh, you have LLVM in general collection of modular and reusable uh, compiler and uh, toolchain technology. Then you have compiler on the top of it. And good thing with Clang is that it is uh, open source modular, supports all C++ versions and so on. So it's very good. As a, uh, and it has uh, uh, many tools. Some of them are static code analysis. So we have Clang tidy, Clang static analysis and compiler warnings, three things. And we have also a lot of dynamic tools and those are sanitizers, memory sanitizers, uh, undefined uh, behavior sanitizers and so on. And they are great as well. They are dynamic tools and they found a lot of bugs. And then on the top of it, you have these analyzers. Uh, Clang static analyzer is one of them and has a lot of checkers. It uses symbolic execution. It is extendable. You can write your own checkers. For example, you have in your organization some design rules that are not covered. You can implement them. Then there is Clang tidy that is using AST that also finds a lot of bugs. And then on the top of it, what I'm presenting today is this code checker project. And that is database and your extension for Clang Static Analyzer. And that's one of the reasons also why when you search, you don't find it. It's not tool as such, it's not complete. It's just the layer on the top of Clang and Clang Tidy. So how does it look like? Uh, from the command line, you run code checker. What it does in the background is running Clang Tidy and Clang Static Analyzer checkers depending on your settings, more or less of them. We have also in Ericsson, some Ericsson checkers that are developed based on our requirements. Some of them we are pushing upstream to Clang static uh, an analysis community. Some are internal, but uh, they're on the top of, uh, let's say these two. And then not only that, we are also using these new analysis features. And as I said, this cross file analysis is the, one of the most important and these statistical checkers. And then once you get results, you push them to database and then you can view them through the browser or uh, integrate it in the CI loops or uh, use Eclipse client or, or something to also view in the ID results. And uh, so code checker would be this whole uh, tooling around the clunks. And this is just a short summary of what it is. So uh, languages that it supports are C, C++ and Objective-C. It's using these ST matches and symbolic execution. You have multiple analysis. At the moment, only those two are supported, but we are working now also on integrating CPP check and uh, later in uh, Facebook Infer and others. Uh, team was also experimenting a little bit with uh, integrating into the summary results, uh, results of dynamic analysis of sanitizers. And that can be also very valuable. It's free. False positive level is uh, very low and you get about 300 plus checks done on, on the top of your code. And this is like having a colleague who is 
in his head having all that knowledge and trying. It's impossible as a human sometimes to have all of these things, you know, um, discoverable easily, especially with the number of steps that these tools support. So uh, first, uh, if you just say Klangsa capabilities, so it's not code checker, I'm now just talking about Klang static analyzer. Uh, it has, for example, um, as capabilities, constraints register for both integer charts and pointers. When it discovers things, it knows if something is integer, it has to be in this range, and if it goes outside, I can report for it. Or if it is Boolean, and again, you have, uh, something else. So during symbolic execution, values are represented as intervals. That's how it works. Another one is memory al alias aliasing is uh, detected. So it follows pointers. It's not just a shallow level of analysis. You have hierarchical memory model for array structs and classes. It expands and all elements are then represented as intervals. Path sensitive analysis, all branches, switches, and so on. Uh, here, uh, one disclaimer, we have it also in limitation. Of course, hardware resources are limited, so you can't always go to all possible paths, but as much as possible, it does. Uh, this context sensitive uh, interprocedural analysis. So, uh, uh, function calls are followed through different files, and I'll show you that how it looks like. In fact, I can show you immediately, maybe. So uh, this is look and feel of the code checker under the runs. I have now just compared a uh, run without uh, cross translational unit uh, analysis and with CPU. And if I diff them, it will list for me all of the findings that could be found with cross translational unit analysis, but not without it. Uh, here you have bug path length. So after 34 steps, this problem has been reported. And if I click on it and see how it looks like, it shows you these steps. You know, if you go here and here and here under these and these conditions, here is the problem. And you can see here also that uh, the files are changing. So it's not all in one file. So here I called the method from another file and then I went back and so on. As a human, you can't follow this number of steps, impossible. And we had some customer TRs with many steps involved because sometimes it's simply, you know, normal testing you cover, <laughs> these edge cases you, you might miss. And uh, to, to us, this visualization with arrows and explanation works very well. We, we like it in, in Ericsson. I don't know if you will like it if you try it, but. Uh, it, it, it is a very good way to visualize the problem. And then uh, if I continue here, limitations, number of unique paths are exponential with the number of branches. So sometimes you don't cover everything. That's also reason for false positives. There is a limit. <laughs> then uh, limited loop unrolling. Uh, by default, if you don't know how big is the loop, how much you should exp you know, expand it. By default, it will be four. If you know how much uh, is the uh, loop condition, you will try to enroll as much as possible. If it says 355, you probably will again not do all of them. But uh, limited call depth also, you cannot go indefinitely because then hardware would be. Uh, too long paths are hard to understand for humans, so sometimes uh, it's not, not easy to follow these 50 steps. But it is uh, true that it's possible as a problem. So, some of uh, code checker features. Um, we have uh, these uh, many types of checks. And as I said, uh, for Clangsa and for Clang Tidy, you can go to links and check, but you have code examples as well, how the uh, problems can look like. This cross translational unit analysis is a new addition. Statistical checkers are also new addition. They're not still open sourced. We use it internally in Ericsson. Plan is to uh, open source it during 2020. And uh, what you find is usually what can miss, be missed during the desk checks. So uh, why do we do all this? Among other things, secure coding is one of the reasons. Uh, we have these, uh, uh, say, cert, I don't know, have you heard of it? Uh, say, cert rules and standard, no? Yeah. So uh, they have a number of, um, 
rules that are defined. So let's make sure. This is the format of the rules. So uh, rules. So rules related to the declarations, expressions, integer, blah, blah, blah. And if you go to uh, one of these groups, so they have numbers for them. And if you go, you see this is example, non-compliant rule. This would be a correction. Uh, and then they explain also which tools would have found them. And none of these should be in the code. <laughs> they have about 350 at least here. Uh, these um, uh, information about the uh, tools that uh, can detect the rule are not regularly updated for all of the tools and some tool vendors don't even submit it. But uh, usually if it was detected with the previous version, it will be detected also in the newer version. And the ones that are not detecting anything are interesting. We didn't update it yet with the code checker additions and uh, it's ongoing. <laughs> we, we have to... Uh, push the, the uh, results so that they update it. But uh, these are security related things that you want to fix in your code. And um, we have done tests and uh, code checker with the Clang 8 version, current version, have covered about 38% of the rules. And usually if some other tool was used, it would be maybe another <laughs> 30, 40 or whatever, 20. And uh, we uh, cannot yet publish our test suite. We have to get first uh, clarification from the uh, CSA cert. And uh, when we tried to add on the top of it sanitizers, it improved uh, even further, about 30% more were found by sanitizers. So both have to be done. Types of things, now pointer direction, secured best practice violation, program hangs, code maintainability issues. No one wants this in the code, isn't it? very costly to go through post-mortem dumps and analyze. But you get a lot of findings. <laughs> Sometimes this falls poison. So. so main reasons to use code checker would be uh, easier visual understanding of uh, uh, defects. So you have this root cause explained how you come to the path. And then it doesn't take long. So sometimes you have to think carefully, you know, uh, what the tool was trying to tell you. And then after I say, wow, yeah, <laughs> tool was right. Uh, but uh, not more than one, two hours would be per checker maximum. Sometimes it's five minutes. And comparing to post-modern dam analysis, that can be total cost very big. Full path coverage, CTO analysis and statistical checkers, they, it's not line coverage, it's really trying to explore all paths through the code, all if deaths, all loops. Uh, overall summary of results. So you have a total overview. Uh -huh, I have this number and when we talk about this overall summary, just to show you in the tool. So we have this uh, checker statistics and here you have overview per type of checker and a small total summary. Of course, we categorize them what are high severity, medium, low and so on. And then you can see, uh -huh, we have, let's say, dividing by zero at 10 places in this open source project. And if you click here, then it gives you the, uh, it's running. So these are current problems. You can sort them. Of course, when you're analyzing, you would first start with those that have a, a smaller part because they are more likely. But you can make a plan and you can say, okay, at my, in my baseline, I'll first check the most serious one and fix them and, and gradually then go forward. But th this is nice, I think. And you can, when you are in the, uh, some of the bugs, also put the comment here. You can also categorize, is it unreviewed or confirmed or false positive and so on. Uh, our recommendation would be not to do it in the database, but in the code itself. Because for the Garrett verification, then it's uh, better, whatever verification that you use or Git or some other tooling. But um, you have also, uh, uh, okay, so all reports here, a possibility to, uh, now I have filtered. Overview. So you have a lot of filterings that you can do. You can list only unique reports or all of them. Uh, you can uh, filter per run name, 
per review status, uh, detection status, severity, and so on. All of these filters uh, uh, work. You can create your own components to group the, the findings. Um, so for example, checker name, I can select one of them and then I'll get only those. And uh, some of them are really <laughs> nasty and good to look at. And uh, okay, so I'll go further. Visibility of depth of finding and sorting per it, I think it's very useful. Suppression handling, uh, Clunksa and Clunk Tidy don't have suppression handling uh, uh, supported. And then if you have false positive, they reappear. But with this, you can add, and I'll show you on one of the next slides how it looks like. Uh, this report generation, easy detection of new defects, and that one is interesting. Uh, because we have database, we can compare what is new comparing to previously stored. And then uh, you can, in fact, have a, a have it useful from the very beginning. Even if you didn't clean up legacy, you can say, okay, this is new. I have introduced it in my implementation. I should fix it before I uh, deliver. And th that's a very important thing. And then uh, is integration to uh, verification tools, additional Ericsson checkers. As I say, some of them are now um, pushed, but not approved yet. It's a process to, to get it. Uh, eclipse integration, low false positive rate parts drooling. So number of, of things. And as I showed you, it goes through the code. It's using approximations and heuristics. So you don't have, no one promises that it's uh, bulletproof that, you know, it will find everything. They are false negatives and they are false positives because of all these limitations that I said, but it will find a lot. And it is in industrial use. Ericsson, Apple and others are using it. So it's not the time saying something that is small company trying it with them. We have a large code base, I believe. <laughs> uh, and it's doing symbolic execution and path coverage. So uh, this is example how it looks like. So simple analysis would be within the same file you have maybe two things and division by zero is detected and that's easy. But then if you just have cross translational unit analysis, uh, two files, Ordinary tools would not find it. And you very often call something from another file. And this would detect it, and that's one of the big powers. And then it uh, finds much, much more findings much, once you turn it on. And then statistical checkers would be, you check something at three places, but not, or two places, but not in the third one. And it says, but why you didn't check it there? Maybe, maybe you missed it. Maybe it was on purpose, I don't know, but these are statistical checkers and they can be also very useful. And th those are these um, now return, negative return, checked return, and so on. So you can find more there. So summary, uh, it finds much more defects if you turn it on. It's scalable and useful in industrial size project. Um, it is uh, accepted to upstream clunk. In the latest version, it is there. If someone wants to use the version with the patch, just use it directly. Even now, it, it works. And try it yourself and see what, how much you, you would more find comparing to the, uh, what you use now. And just explanation about how this works. So you can do testing on executable level or on the library level. Let's say I change three files. Those three files are in some more small library. I can do analysis only of that library. But what will I then be able to do? I will just go from my library down. My paths are just there. If I'm delivering to my customer executable, well, he doesn't care if I may change here. So from his point of view, anything in this whole thing should be explored. So running analysis on executable level will give you more complete picture. But because of limitations, in fact, sometimes you will not find when you run here, all the things right here. So the more, the, the better. If you can run, run it here and here and run with CPU and without CPU. Why? If you run without CPU, then the parts that you will manage to cover without limitations will be different. So this is just to be smart when setting up tools that, uh, to, to think of these other aspects. It's not only, you know, I want it as simple as possible. It depends what you want. If you want to find as many bugs, then you should set more. 
And then example of the flag usage. So you can say, run me CTU, run me statistical checker, checkers. I want this report hash twenty three. Want par to parallelize uh, ten of parallel analysis uh, um, threads. You can provide skip file if you don't want some part of the code to be analyzed. You can enable profiles, so uh, it has a couple of profiles. Sensitive would be, by default, um, you get certain set of checkers. If you are really security concern or whatever, you can enable sensitive properties. It's a little bit more, but it will find things that you would like to get fixed. <laughs> then apart from that one, you can enable some additional checkers and you decide which ones you want, depending on your organization. And then if some of them is very, uh, too many false positive on your code base. Like there was something that users were doing. You can then disable some checkers. So you can enable or disable. It's up to you to decide. I would recommend try to use more and see how it goes and see where you see that, you know, maybe you don't get as much. And if you want to list uh, uh, all of the checkers included in some profile, this is the type of command that you use. And you can always say code checker minus minus help or code checker and then another layer and minus minus help. It's, that will show you all of the levels of suppression handling. So when we get the report, what happens? It might be real bug and you have to fix it. Or maybe it is bug, tool is correctly reporting it, but for some reason you say, um, I, I don't know, want to fix it. It's better that, you know, my application crashes than to fix it. Let's call it intentional. And then the last one is this false positive. That means tool is wrong. And in that case, we should report it so that it's addressed. So if you find problems with the tool, instead of just say, ah, crap, it's another tool, please report those because then someone has, will be analyzing them and maybe fixing the next version will have a better tool. So especially in open source projects, it definitely makes sense to, why not to, to try. Uh, before doing suppressions, uh, read the documentation. It's explained what you can do. You can use a search. You can help the tool to understand things and get better. Uh, but if you decide to do suppress things, you can inside the code just put code checker false positive or code checker intentional and code checker confirmed with the name of the checker and then it will, uh, accept it in the analysis, show it in the database as well. And uh, this is just a small comment. If by mistake you add suppression into code and then change your mind, but you already pushed to the database, you have to make sure to align them because database already knows about suppression, but just small thing. And then the next thing. Uh, so what do we have? We have true positive. That would be problem in your code. Treat it as a trouble report, treat it as something that you have to fix. Collect statistics about identify issues, track accuracy of checkers. That's also interesting as a uh, data. Why? Because if you know that out of bound is 100% accurate most of the time, and then someone comes, new person in the team and says, oh, the tool is finding all false positive questions. <laughs> you know, let's check and see if, if it's right. True positives, intentional, whatever is the reason. False positive should be improved. Tool should be improved. And false negative, it might be your configuration of the tool that is incorrect. Maybe you are not using correct uh, set of checkers, maybe something else. Or tool doesn't detect. But uh, in any case, uh, you should analyze code and you should prepare standalone reproducing by example and report tickets in both cases to help to improve it if you decide to go that way. You can do it without it, but I'm just saying that that can be helping community and uh, improving the tool. Demo. Uh, I already showed you a little bit of the tool, uh, but I'll go now also through the steps, how you would uh, go through the settings. You have documentation online, but what do you do? Analyze the project, view results, upload results to the database, add a bug, fix a bug, push again and so on. So these steps, I have a couple of snapshots because uh, I knew that the time will be tight. And instead of me now trying to go to the shell and everything, I just took a couple of snapshots. So uh, first of all, when you run the analysis, um, you will, of course, download the code checker project and so on. And then after that, you have this code checker script uh, and it has number of commands. First one is logging. So 
you log your build command and it creates out of that build JSON file, build database with everything that was being run for your target, for your build. Uh, this first step is purely to get the JSON file. And uh, in our case, we have uh, noticed that it takes time to compile code. So we even uh, improve some things to avoid compilation and just get the JSON file with or without. It doesn't care if it's with code tracker logging or differently, but you get the JSON file. Once you have it, then you are using it in the analyze command to uh, do the analysis. And there you can put these additional like CTU, statistical checkers and so on. This is just the most simple version. And then it will do start analysis, it will do conk tidy, it will do conk st static analysis, finish with it and give the report. Next thing is how to view the results. Uh, if you want to view them in just in the command line, you can use this parse command. And if you do it, then it will just list all of the steps one after another. So it's command lines, not database. You can see it that way. That can be handy for some post-processing of logs or something if you want. But uh, in general, you, you get the summary at the end. And uh, then you want to push that to the database. That would be the next step. You can also, because this wasn't too friendly, or you want to produce HTML output, it's nice with these arrows, then you can run, uh, uh, please get me HTML instead. And it will make a small little database for you with the results. So it will generate and, and you will have it uh, with a similar look and feel like in the real database, but look. But then uh, if you want to, um, really use it in the normal CI integration, you should have an official database and your CI job should push to that one and that's official one. So you should set it up and uh, for the code checker server as well, push the store results into the code checker server. Then uh, if you want to list results changes after the code update, then you can uh, do this report new. So here you see that we are saying new. So you're comparing using some regular expression matches or whatever with what is stored in the database and you detect what was new in your latest run. Um, you fix the code rerun and then it shouldn't have anything. So now it's no results on the previous one. It reported that there was something different. And in general, uh, if you have false positives, uh, it's good that you try to explain the tool what to do. So with using asserts uh, and uh, partial functions and so on, you can improve the uh, rate of the false positive to be smaller. And that's what was recommendation before as well, not to suppress unless you really have to. Uh, if you have some third party code, that you can't change, you can skip it if you want, or you can get the results and go back to the supplier and say, sorry guys, you have problems in the code. Security issues, fix them. So uh, if nothing else helps, then put the suppression. So you see there how the suppression looks like. Code checker suppression, security, blah, blah, and it will suppress it. This is how the skip file looks like. You can say this, this, and this. Skip and this should be added. This should be avoided. Uh, recommended deployment. I would say like this. When you are implementing new tool, but this is general. It's not about code checker only. Whenever you have a new tool, new version of the tool, new settings for the tool, of course, you will find more things or different things. So what happens is that then you find new things in the legacy. In your current version of the code, they, become visible. And what then? Well, the best would be prevent new defects if you can as soon as you can. So that with new settings, you're not adding more and more faults. With the code checker, because we have this comparison, we can detect new findings, you can get immediately benefit. So install it, run it, store it in the database legacy, and you can then prevent new things. And then, yes, you will find a lot of things in legacy. Let's say you enabled all sensitive checkers and who knows how many, you have seen open source projects, what, what they had. You decide what to fix. Maybe not all of them, maybe most critical ones. Decide the plan for cleanup, decide the order of cleanup, and then gradually do it. It can take some time. 
you know, no one expects teams are usually working on features and other things, but at least you will have it visible. Another thing is that if you're uh, investigating some customer TR, you will have results you can check, oh, maybe tool reported it. And that can make it shorter for you because it has explanation of the steps, which you don't have and you only have post-marking them. Limitations? Well, as I said, you can't go through all of the paths and uh, sometimes because of hardware limitations, you, you, you simply don't get everything. You have some analysis budget, depending on how big is the loop, you can't explore all of the paths always. And uh, we have this trans uh, analysis between files and that is, but how can you get more complete results? One of the reasons also why we sometimes don't increase settings is that analysis takes too long. But I would say with static code analysis, don't be, uh, don't put time as the most critical aspect. Static analyzer is like your colleague who is doing desk check and you wouldn't push, Pavel, you have to do it in five minutes. No, Pavel <laughs> will maybe take three hours. But uh, these very sophisticated 40, you know, lines or, or whatever, they're valuable in itself. So sometimes maybe increase the uh, uh, settings and over the weekend run and get more results and then look into them. So th these are your candidates for faults in the code. I would say, uh, you know, treat them like that. Of course, what you're putting into the verification loop should be fast and set it up in such a way, but also maybe explore these other things. And um, uh, summary, I can show you maybe a little bit more. I still have time. I'm good with time. So in the tool itself, how the things look. Uh, any questions about this uh, setup of the tool so far? I hope it's okay that I was not doing it in the shell, but th these are the type of things that you will uh, have to do if you want to try it. Uh, this is how it looks uh, at the beginning. Oh. This is running this demo setup in some container. Demo, demo. So uh, when you just install it and do some runs, um, you get the um, overview of all the runs. Okay, so these are the different runs. And then uh, if you are admin, you would have here extra admin interface and then you can set up who can access results. Because code is exposed, maybe you have security policies and one that not everyone in the organization can access the code. So you can set the LDAP groups or whatever. So that, that part is supported. The, I am not admin in this instance, that's why I don't see it, because I logged in as demo demo. <laughs> the second thing is when you do runs, they are reported here, you can see what were analyzers used, how many findings and what were the commands and what was the code checker version used and so on. If you end, uh, uh, click on any of them, you will see in this run what we had. All of these tabs give you different, uh, so we have run history, uh, this one was only run, but if uh, once run, but if you had done it seven times, you can also diff there and see what was uh, happening. Checker statistics. Uh, if you go to one of the checkers, uh, you can get also a checker name. So uh, if you go to Clangsa homepage, it will list for you for this particular, you know, uh, for all of the, in fact, Clangsa. Uh, things, what are the examples of the code and the explanation of what it is and so on. Another thing is uh, new features. Whenever we have new version, they nicely write down what was new in each of the versions. I'm trying with uh, our designers whenever we get new version also to use actively new things. And that's a nice thing. We, we, we sometimes forget to uplift tools and it's a pity because you're running it anyway. Why not to run it to full extent? Any tool, doesn't matter, code checker or something else. Uh, then uh, you have also here um, 
reporting uh, of the bugs, you have user guide, you have new features listed. I go back now to runs. Uh, if you want to compare the, the code between um, a sorted pair name, so let's say uh, you can see what is, for example, in the um, What is in the TMUX baseline comparing to this run that was just with CTU or vice versa? This will give me opposite. What is in the one and not in the other? And if you try it, try it yourself with CTU, without CTU, with non CTU, and do the diff both ways, and you will see what are the unique findings and if you get something more or not. Uh, try to run with sensitive proba. Try to run and, and see simply what you get. Um, I think that this filtering can be really useful and uh, good. If you are admin, you can configure components. So there will be edit button and then you can save which regular expressions to use to, to get them. Um, what else? Doesn't have to be too complicated. In fact, this is the, the main thing. You see visualization, you see, so dividing by zero, let's see dividing by zero after 15 steps, and it will take me through the code. Under these and these conditions. As a human, never. How would you find it? And the idea would be that uh, since CPP check already supports PLIST, we want to visualize here also the errors from the other uh, uh, tools. And maybe from Facebook inf infer and so on. If they don't have visualization, then at least we can import and visualize it at one place for all of them. And dynamic analysis and so on. Okay, so further plans. Uh, idea is that we add multiple analyzers, like CPP check and infer and, and so on. Uh, more checkers, we are prioritizing on which to work, but it would be great if open source community would work and if someone else contributes with some checker because the more contribute, the faster we would get something. Uh, uh, at the moment it's using Python 2, it will be updated to Python 3. Debian packages will be released. Uh, we have at the moment, uh, in total, it was 27 contributors so far. In the last uh, year, it was five active for the new checkers and features. Uh, yeah, open source projects are an analyzed regularly, uh, like Firefox Chrome and so on. Docker image is prepared just lately. You can try to use it. And this is how you would set it. Uh, I have seen this, uh, uh, I was preparing for the demo, so I searched around and found this very interesting link, I must say. Uh, some Italian <laughs> company, but they had examples. They're running various open source tools. They have wrapped them up as well, like their products. If you, and then they had a demo for Clang Analyzer, for Facebook Infer, for SonarQ, for this, for that, and they put this like Clang and Facebook. I don't see it this way. For me, it would be friends. <laughs> you know, it's not competition, it, it, especially for this one because here they're both open source. But I'm not saying, uh, you know, that using commercial is bad. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's just um, how much money you can put on, on one or the other. And this can be extra free, find something. You evaluate what, what, what is. But uh, for example, for testing and comparing tools, that's also where you can help. If you're using something and you do some kind of comparison and find you can say what, what is used there because no point, for example, implementing the same checker and prioritizing it if another open source tool is anyway finding it and we can integrate them together. The, the security aspect and other things are also there important. So summary, define good strategy for legacy cleanups if you decide to do it. It can be valuable, I think. Uh, if you decide to use it, uh, I think it would be nice if you can get in touch with, uh, through me, with my team, <laughs> and that uh, we, we see how maybe some of the things can be reported. Because uh, reusing and sharing, reporting bugs is also helpful. If you have found a code example and can make it standalone, that helps to, to understand and then with academia, they 
<laughs> go through it, find out how to improve the tool to fix it. And uh, compare the tool so that we can maybe specialize in some way. So this was what I have prepared for today. Uh, do you, sorry that I was not asking too many for, too much for questions, but I thought since it's m new for most of you to, to just go through it. But if you have some questions now or that we. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, you can define, you can set it in the environment variable or in the file. So, so you, but, but you, you are in charge to decide what you want to run. You can do it individual rules or using these profiles and then fine tuning them. They have uh, about four different profiles. So it's worth to check it all and see. Some are alpha checkers. Uh, usually new, tool, uh, new checker is first in the alpha stage when they say, we are not sure if it's stable or not. If you want, you can try alpha checkers. Once it's stable, then it becomes part of the profile. Can you define profile externally? Like in the database that view the CI pipeline or the class of build agents? Instead of catering each box individually, you could configure it in one place? You mean that uh, different pipelines run different checkers or what? Yeah. yeah. You, you can play with it and do the settings in a different ways. We didn't see that as a problem. You, you know, it's a command that is run in Jenkins job or somewhere that, that just uses a different file. So you can do, yeah. And I would say one thing to watch out for in general, not just for code checker, when you are doing uplifts of the tools, so new version or new setting, always <laughs> don't do it. So that would be tip and trick. Don't do it immediately on the live project. Do it on the side branch, understand differences, understand what's happening. It was happening with Clang uh, analyzers that they rename things, that they change things. And then you end up with a little bit of mess because you had maybe some things that were using old names. <laughs> so understand implication. And when you are ready, then you release it on the uh, you know, normal flow. Some more questions? No, no, if you, if you run code checker, it will run for you, Clang Sa and Clang Tide. Right. Like, as, as probable. As probable. So, so we are not adding anything there. It's simply, so what, what uh, so, so you're using Clang Sa and Clang Tide, but you're adding on the top of them features for the, cross-translational unit analysis. And that feature will in itself add you more. Yeah. yeah. Basically, it's but it's, that's the start, yeah. And uh, in the uh, next version of Clang 9, this will be released. So that is coming, I, I think, in December. We should have a new version of uh, Code Checker 6.11 that is based on the next Clang. And then you will have the, the CPU officially as well. Now you can use just the commit. What does AQ can play around? Take care of the conflict in terms of infinite loops. It's like if the system goes into deadlock, does it take care of this infinite loop deadlock as well? The Clang analyzer when you redo the report. Well, it will report some of them, but uh, depending on this exploration path, mm -hmm. it might have some false negatives, but it will detect some of them. The pipeline that you can say around the branches that is. How does it look? What is your gut feeling? What you need is set up database, do the run of your code on the side, push it to database, see what you get. I mean, that's an integration. 
integrated. So that is your uh, report. I hope I'm not going too much into education part, but uh, in this area of I'm lucky that uh, I'm in contact with my co team in Hungary that is really passionate and <laughs> uh, proactive and so on. Uh, I, I think it's good to know this type of things because you, you can get more from the tools and why not? Thank you.